Everybody, you are about to watch the Fala Bible Church program, the moment of transformation. Today, by the grace of the Lord, we shall listen to our pastor, General Superintendent, Pastor W.F. Kumoyi. You are going to be blessed. It is my wish that you call your family to come and listen to you as our pastor is blessing you with his holiness message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're coming to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I'm reading to you from verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. It's talking to brothers and sisters. It's talking to members of the family of God. Those who are born again. Those who are children of God, washed and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, brothers and sisters, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, ye mourn not, ye grow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe, thank God I believe, I say, thank God I believe. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain until the coming, until the coming of the Lord shall not proceed, shall not hinder, shall not prevent them which are asleep, which are dead. For the Lord himself, not an angel, the Lord himself, not one of the prophets that died, for the Lord himself, Jesus Christ, shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and for the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be cut up. That's the rapture. The word rapture you'll not find in the Bible. There's some people that they say, show me that word in the Bible. Actually, you're going to find there are lots of things that a lot of words you may not find in the Bible. For example, the word Bible itself. In the Greek, Biblia, the books. A library of books, 66 books. You'll not find that word Bible in the Bible. And yet we know this is the Holy Bible. The word Trinity you'll not find in your Bible. But we know that Jesus said... You baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the Son, and the love of God, that's the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, be with you all. The teaching is there, but you don't find the word Trinity there. And so the word rapture actually is a Latin word. It means being cut up. Those who have died in Christ, they will be raised incorruptible. And those who are still alive, like you and I, if you're a believer, if you're a child of God, if you're saved, washed, and cleansed in the blood of the Lamb, it says, we shall be caught up, that's the rapture, together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. To meet the Lord in the air. There are people that confuse the rapture with the second coming. When Christ comes the second time, which is referred to as the second coming of Christ, he will not stay in the air. He'll come to the earth here. And his feet will touch Mount Olivet. That's the second coming. That's after the rapture. That's after the great tribulation. But... Before the great tribulation, 
the rapture. We will meet the Lord not on a mountain, but in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I'll be there. Where are you? I said, I will be there. You'll be there in Jesus' name. He says, wherefore, if you're a believer, wherefore, if you're a child of God, wherefore, if you're a member of the body of Christ, comfort one another with these words. I want to ask you a question. How do you respond to the teaching of the rapture of the church? I'm talking to you this morning on proper response to Christ's return. Proper response to Christ's return. The people, when they hear about the rapture, about the coming of Christ again, they are passive. Passive, that means no action, no action taken. And they are lethargic, they look warm. They are inactive. And I want to ask you, as you hear about the rapture, the return of Christ, are you passive? Number two, there are people who are pensive. They are tensed up. They are afraid. They are disturbed. Because they know that if Christ shall come, they are not ready. They have not repented. Or maybe they repented before. They are backsliding. They are living in a hidden sin, secret sin, cherished sin. And it's so heavy on their hearts. Every time they hear Christ is coming, Christ is coming. They are pensive. And it's like, will he come? Is he coming now? I've not made my way right. I've not done the necessary restitution, restoration. I have not come fully unto the Lord. I don't think I'm ready. And because of that, they are pensive and sad and anxious and fearful and frightened and disturbed. Some are passive about you. Others are pensive How about you. Thank God. Others, number three, are positive. They are practical. They are active. They are preparing. They are hopeful. Christ may come today. Glad day. Glad, glad day. And I will see my friend, my Savior. I will see him, the one who loves me so much. And he died for me. Glad day, glad day shall Christ come today. Positive. And you want to determine your own response to the coming of the Lord. As you look at this stop subject, proper response to Christ's return, you open to Titus chapter 2. Proper response, Christ is coming. You respond positively, not being passive or pensive. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, you have to have the grace of God in you and the strength of God in you that will say no to Satan. No to sin, no to temptation, and no to all the society around you, the world, and no to all those bad habits that were picked up in your sinful days. Because the grace of God comes in after you have repented, you are born again, you are a child of God, and it teaches us that denying ungodliness. And what they lost, we should live how? Frivolously, carelessly, like a jester, a clown in society. It's superficial, never having an attitude of seriousness. But here the people are dying. 
but people might hurt, might hear. The Christ is coming, might hear. The judgment day is coming. Are you ready for that day when it comes? They're still superficial and careless. They never think about their never dying souls, about where they will spend eternity. But it says, it teaches us that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. Where? Tell me out loud. The people that tell us we cannot be godly now, the world is so sinful. Our depravity is so deep and is so entrenched in us. We cannot live a righteous life, a holy life, a godly life. But it says, the grace of God comes in. And we live soberly, righteously, and we live godly in this present world. Look at verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope. We prepare. We respond properly. We respond positively. We respond with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, wanting to serve the Lord, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. Of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. That he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify, that's sanctification, purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Proper response to Christ's return. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, purposeful preparation for the rapture. Purposeful preparation for the rapture. Number two, perplexing peril at his return. When he returns, either for the rapture or for the second coming, either the first appearance or the second advent, there's going to be perplexity and peril, pain, danger for the people who are lost. For the people who do not make it at the time of the rapture. Number three, preeminent or predominant priority of the righteous. Preeminent priority of the righteous. You're thinking about Christ's return. You're thinking about the rapture. You're thinking about the fulfillment of prophecies concerning the coming of Christ again. And you want to have preparation, proper response, so that you'll not miss out at that time. I pray you'll not miss out in Jesus' name. Number one, purposeful preparation for the rapture. I want to concentrate now on first Thessalonians, something will probably surprise you and also will delight you. That this topic of the rapture is mentioned in every chapter of First Thessalonians. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and chapter 5. Not only that. It's mentioned at the end of every chapter, end of every chapter in 1 Thessalonians. Let's look at this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 8. It says, from, from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your face talk to God word is spread abroad. So that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we urge unto you. And now ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Look at this. And to wait for his son from heaven. Your father is coming? Yes, he's coming. How do you respond? To wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Chapter 2. In chapter 2, I'm reading the last two verses. Verses 19 and 20. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are ye not 
and not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. His coming. What will be the joy of the preacher? That the converts are abiding. The converts are faithful. And the converts remain until that time. For ye are our glory and joy. Chapter 3. In chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 11. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one to another and toward all men, even as we do toward you to the end for the purpose he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. You have the emphasis in every chapter. Come to chapter 4. Reading now from verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Chapter 5. In chapter 5 from verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto, until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithfully see that calleth you who also will do it. As uh, the Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, emphasizes and underscores and underlies the coming of Christ again, the rapture of the church, the rapture of the saints, when Christ shall come and take his beloved one home. He also emphasizes how we prepare how we get ready. And these uh, verses I've read to you, they show us the purposeful preparation for the rapture. Come back to chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 9 and verse 10. It says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you. How ye turned to God from idols. That's salvation. That's salvation. You're waiting for the coming of the Lord. There must be salvation. How ye turned to God from idols to serve the living God, the true God. That's occupation. You are occupied. Occupy until I come. Number one, how do you get ready? How do you prepare for the coming of the Lord? It says, number one, the salvation. You turn to God from all your idols. Number two, there's occupation. Number three, there's expectation and to wait for his son from heaven. Expectation. Those three things come out very clearly in that chapter 1. That I'm preparing to get ready. How are you preparing? What are you doing? How are you getting yourself ready? Salvation. Occupation. Expectation. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. It tells us that we turn. We turn from sin to the Savior. We turn from idols, uh, the deities that are no gods. And we turn to the true God and to the living God. And we turn from self. And we turn to Christ, our Savior, our Sanctifier. We turn from everything that is evil, everything of darkness. And we turn to what symbolizes the light for us, Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Turning unto God. It tells us in Acts chapter 3. Verse 26, unto you first, God, having raised up his son, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. 
in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. I do hope you understand that. That turning away is not that when, when we say, you know, somebody is a sinner. It doesn't mean that if there are 1,000 sins in the world, that that person has committed all the, all the 1,000 sins. That's why some people say, I think I'm all right. They're not saved. They think they're all right. They're not born again. They think they're all right. They're church goers. They think they're all right. They have not been turned away from sin. And they think they're all right. What do they say that? They look at all the sins that other people are committing. And they say that one is highway robber. They say that one is a rogue. They say that one is an adulterer. They say that one is a fornicator. They say that one is a drunkard. Whatever. And they say, thank God, like a Pharisee. I don't do that. I'm all right. Does that mean you're saved? No. To turn everyone away from his own iniquity. Your own sin is what you turn away from. You'll not turn away from the Pharisee's sin. You'll not turn away from the drunkard's sin. You'll not turn away from the fornicator's sin. If you're not a fornicator, but your own sin. Your own evil may be what you call white lie, small lie. May be what you call hypocrisy. May be pretense. May be getting angry or fighting. Whatever it is, might be stealing, stealing from the family. Might be doing things that are not right in the secret. Although you look like an angel outside, you know your own iniquity, salvation. You don't repent of other people's sins. You don't turn away from other people's sins. You turn away from your own iniquity. That's how those Thessalonians prepared. Number one, salvation. Number two, occupation. That they were telling other people. And they said, all we want to do every day of our lives is to serve the true and the living God. And that's why we're told in Ephesians chapter 12. Ephesians chapter 12, and I'm reading here from verse 28. Ephesians chapter 12, we're reading from verse 28. Why don't you start from verse 27? And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things which that are shaking, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken, may remain. It's telling us that in the world in which we live, many of the things you see are going to be rolled up, are going to be burnt up, are going to be taken away, are going to be burnt in the latter day fire. But there are things that cannot be burnt, that cannot be taken away. It says those things that will be shaken, they will be shaken out of the way. Wherefore, verse 28, Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, which cannot be moved, which cannot be removed. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. New Testament, godly fear, the fear of God. There are people who don't have any fear of God. And the reason why they don't have any fear of God is that number one, there's self-deception. I don't think I can be lost. What do, what do you think like that? I don't think I can miss it. Why do you think like that? I think I'll get to heaven. It's not a matter of thinking. Are you saved? Are you born again? Are you living a righteous life? That's why they don't have the fear of God. Other people don't have the fear of God because of erroneous teaching. Once saved, always saved. I'm saved and saved forever. I'm born again. And so I'm forever born again. Nothing can move me. Even if I go into whatever, go into whatever, I know I will come back. How do you know you will come back? We don't hear about demons coming back, about Judas and God coming back. The people that will be lost because of erroneous teaching. They do not have the fear of God. Other people, they just uh, have their own, they, they maybe wrong influence upon them. Somebody is telling them, somebody is showing them, do it, you'll be all right. We're backing you up. We're supporting you. If it comes to the knowledge of anybody and they want to do anything, we'll stand for you. 
will hold up for you. They will not stand for you when you get to the brink of hell. You'll perish. Those people, they'll perish themselves and they'll not be able to help you. And because of self-deception, because of false doctrine, and because of wrong influence, that's why they don't have the fear of God. It tells us in verse 29, for our God is, tell me, is that Old Testament or New Testament? Tell me out loud. Tell me out loud. New Testament for our God is a consuming fire. Occupation, serve the Lord with all your strength. Expectation, waiting. Look at that again in First Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1, and we're reading here from verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven. The angel said, ye men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, whom you have seen going up into heaven, will so come likewise. He's coming again. And he's coming to rapture, to take you, to catch away the saints, to take us from the earth and to take us to the sky, to the air, and then to heaven. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That's the rapture. It's coming again. What are we doing now? We're waiting for a son from heaven. Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, reading from verse 34. Luke chapter 12, reading from verse 34. Waiting. Waiting expectantly. Waiting righteously, waiting while we are occupied in the work of the Lord. In Luke chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 34. It tells us in verse 34, For where your treasure is there, where your heart be also, let your loins be guarded about, and your loins and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord. That's what Jesus said. Be a person that is expectant. Be like a man, like a woman, waiting for his Lord. If, if he's your Lord, you know he's coming again. You know he said, I'll be coming back. I'll take you home. How are you waiting? Expectantly. And then he goes on to say in that verse 36, when he will return from the wedding. That when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. We're coming to First Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading from verses 19 and 20. First Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're looking at verse 19. It says, for what is our hope, or our joy, or our crown of rejoicing? And not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. For ye are our glory and joy. Here Paul the apostle was saying that the joy he had was that he wasn't running in vain. There were people that were coming to the Lord through his ministry. And because they were coming to the Lord and they were staying, abiding. And serving the Lord, not people who are falling and rising, going in and coming out. Not people who are one leg in the church and one leg in the world. The people who are saved, born again, and righteous, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And made righteous, stable in the kingdom of God. He said, this is my joy. That when Christ shall come, you, the abiding believers... You, the abiding converts, you will be there. The source of joy at his coming. And, and you want to notice how Paul, the apostle, warned those converts of the Lord. Number one, he preached in spite of great difficulties. In spite of great difficulties. There are some few people in the kingdom... Once there's a little challenge, a little difficulty, I cannot preach. I cannot talk. I cannot tell people that Jesus is Lord. Look at my family difficulty. Look at my family challenge. 
Look at my professional difficulty, challenge. And look at all the enemies. And run into the mountain, run into the valley. Kill my enemies. Destroy my enemies. The enemies are too many for me. I cannot do anything. The challenges are too many. Paul had difficulties. And in spite of those difficulties, he preached the word. And he said, this is my joy. Those converts abiding, those converts who are alive in the Lord. He preached the gospel in spite of great distances. He didn't just stay in Antioch. He didn't just stay in a place. He went all about and he said, I fully preach the gospel in Illyricum and every other place. And he traveled by sea, traveled by land. He walked. He took the sheep. Great distances. Not only that, he preached the gospel in spite of great distress. The distress, the imprisonment that came upon him. And the challenges that came upon him. There are some people that have forgotten that we will have tribulation, will have a trial, will have trouble, will have difficulty, will have persecution. And once there's a little opposition and a little trial of faith, then they give up. They say, I cannot continue again. How many people were workers in the vineyard of, in the, vineyard of the Lord before? How many people were maybe pastors of full local churches before? And they were workers in the vineyard of the Lord, but now we have not seen you for some time. What's happening to you? You're tired. You're fed up. Family problem. Children giving you difficulty, giving you challenge. Husband giving you challenge. Wife giving you challenge. My difficulties, my challenges will not allow me. Paul was not like that. He said, I'm winning converts. Difficulties are there. Distresses are there. Dangers are there. And challenges are there. Distances are there. I'll keep on doing it. You'll keep on doing it in Jesus' name. Let me hear your amen. amen. Difficulties must come. Because we must enter the kingdom of God through all those trials. In spite of those trials, in spite of those difficulties, in spite of those challenges, and there are people that are wasting their lives, wasting their resources. And they say, they're fasting and praying. And I say, what are you praying for? I'm praying that persecutions will go. Uh -uh. Persecutions will not all go. God will give you grace to bear the persecution. Give me a good amen there. Yeah. Challenges will go. Uh -uh. Challenges will not go. Challenges will be there. Problems will all vanish away. They will not all vanish away. Jesus Christ himself said, when you are persecuted, he didn't say pray to take it away. He said, rejoice. You rejoice. He said, because great is your reward in heaven. In spite of difficulties, he preached. In spite of great distances, he preached. In spite of great distresses, he preached. And in spite of great distractions, he preached. Come to chapter 3. In chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 13. It says in verse 13, of chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians. It says to the end for the purpose. He may establish your hearts. Unblameable in holiness before God. Even our father. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What all he says. He says it's coming. There's something the Lord will be looking for. When he comes. And that's why if you're waiting for the coming of the Lord. You're not just folding your hands. Closing your eyes, closing your mouth, be stagnant, just somewhere there, and there's no progress at all spiritually. There must be holiness. What kind of holiness? It tells us, number one, unblameable in holiness. That when heaven examines that, holiness, holiness of heart, holiness in your spirit, holiness in your secret life. Holiness in your thoughts, holiness in your mind, holiness in your desires, unblameable in holiness. Number two, uncompromising in holiness. If there's anything the devil is fighting against in the believer's life, it is a holiness of life, holiness of heart. Why? Because he knows whatever else you have, whatever else you do, wherever else you go, whatever else you possess, 
Whatever gifts you manifest, Satan doesn't worry about that. He can allow you to cast out devils, allow you to speak in tongues, allow you to prophesy, allow you to do many wonderful works. Satan is not bothered about that. If he can take away from you that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. He can get you to become violent, become bad tempered, become angry, become hypocritical. If he can get you to become covetous, if he can get you to do evil, secret evil that nobody knows, and then he allows all the other things going on in your life because he knows that is what you need. If you're going to see the Lord on the final day, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Lord. Number one, unblameable in holiness. Number two, uncompromising in holiness. The people around you will like you to compromise your holiness. People far away cannot influence you. People who don't know you cannot influence you. People who don't live with you cannot influence you. People who are living far away don't even have your phone number. They cannot influence you. Who can influence you to compromise holiness? The people who are near. The people who are close. The people, we call them friendly foes. We call them, uh, they say they are friends, but they are foes. And they want to hinder you from getting to heaven. And they want to, all they want you to do is to compromise your holiness. But if you're going to make it, and I pray you'll make it. Yeah. Am I talking to somebody here today? Yeah. I said you'll make it in Jesus' name. Yeah. Unblameable in holiness. Uncompromising in holiness. Number three, unwavering in holiness. That you stand at the rock of Gibraltar. That everything men or demons throw at you. That holiness will stand. You say, here I stand on this word of God. Cleansed, purified, purged, made holy. I will allow anything to go. I'll deny myself of everything, literally everything, but this holiness, I'll never give it up. I pray that will be you. You know, if the devil knows there's something in your life that is more important than holiness to you, that you'll say, holiness might have to go, but this one I'll not let this go. If he knows that, it's going to tempt you in that area. But when you get on your knees, and you make your consecration to the Lord, and you say, take the world and give me Jesus. Take all their pleasures and give me Jesus. Take all the things that appear needful, necessary, but give me Jesus. And he knows that you are wavering in holiness, the devil will stop tormenting you. It might take something away like he did for Job. I will say, I know my Redeemer liveth. It might take another sin away. And then you say, I don't care for that. None of these things move me. All I want, all I want to keep is holiness. That's how you get to heaven. But the people who are saying, I've lost this, I've lost this, because I'll not give bribes, because I'll not, uh, you know, give them cola nuts, because I'll not do this, kick back and all that. That's why I've lost this. And then you go and you're asking people, how do you make it? How do you do it? That you're still keeping this, you're keeping, ah, they say, you're too much of deeper life. You're too much holy. You're too much of rapture. You're too much of the return of Christ. If you will bend this way and bend this way and bend that way, you'll get it to you. Uh, is that so? And if the devil knows you can bend, he'll make you bend. I will not bend. I said, I will not bend. That's what they want us to do. Let Daniel bend. And Daniel said, you don't know what you're talking about. I'll face the lions rather than bench. You'll face any challenge of your life. You'll be unblameable in holiness. Give me a good amen over there. Yeah. Uncompromising in holiness. Yeah. You will be unwavering in holiness. That's what it takes for you to be ready at the time 
of the coming of the Lord. I'm coming to chapter 4. As you come to chapter 4, it says in verse 15, For this will say unto you, by the watch of the Lord, not by the opinions of men. This will say unto you, by the watch of the Lord, not by the ideas of the theologians. This is the watch of the Lord, that we, which are alive and remain, Unto the coming of the Lord shall not proceed, prevent, or hinder them which are asleep. It means we must remain, we must abide. He that abideth in me, and my word abides in him. He is the one that when he comes, he'll take, he'll take home. Not the people who are today, they're there, tomorrow they're not there. We are abiding. It look, look at this in verse, in verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The dead in Christ, they continued in Christ until they died. You say they were born again? Yes, it's more than that. You say they were children of God before they died. Yes, but it's more than that. There are people. They're born again. There is sickness that comes. You don't know the last sickness that will come before you die. Many people have died of sickness, you know. And that's a common experience. But when they're sick, and then they pray, and the Lord is saying, leave it like that. My grace is sufficient for you. I'm preparing you to get you home. And they pray again, and they're not healed. And they go to coordinator, they go to pastor, they go to GS or whoever, and they're not, they not healed. Because it's the final sickness that God wants to use to say, come back home. Then their people will come and say, have you seen your pastor? Yes, I saw him. And you have not been healed? That's what we are telling you. We will we'll do it for you. We will carry you away. And then we we'll carry you to one shrine. That uh, papa, he never misses it. They rob you. And they, they, but you will do what they say. This is not deeper life now. You must be well. And they say, it's okay. What can I do now? I've been praying. Coordinators have prayed for me. Jesus prayed for me. I wasn't healed. Therefore, they carry them. And they carry them to the shrine. Nobody will carry me to shrine. I said, nobody will carry me to the shrine. If I die, let me die. In the bosom of the Lord. If I die, let me die. While serving the Lord. While you know the Lord. While you are alive in the Lord. But they carry them to the shrine, and they, I will repent later. I know this is bad. I know this is idol worship. I know this is superstition. I know this is evil. I know that is, this is backsliding. Let, let Satan heal me first, then I'll go back to God. Satan is not going to heal you. Satan, Satan doesn't want to heal anybody. Satan wants to kill you there, and eventually they die. And then their people come to church, they say, your brother died. No, it's not my brother. You see your brother? Died in the shrine. Died in the bosom of Satan. Because they cannot endure that little thing. It says, they that die in Christ, they asleep in Christ. Those are the people that will rise up. If I die before the rapture, the watching, I go up before you who are alive. Because it says, we shall not prevent them. We shall not precede them. We shall go up in the air. That resurrection will take part of it in Jesus' name. Yeah. Abiding, abiding until the final day. Not because there's a little challenge. They backslide. They go into false doctrine. They go into all these superstitious fasting. Somebody is helping them, delivering them. What's the deliverance you are going through? Because uh, you know this and because of that, I pray you repent today. That if you are not going to have money, if you have Jesus, you don't have money, that's good enough. Not to have wife, don't have husband, don't have children, don't have health, don't have prosperity, but you have Jesus, you have holiness, 
I pray you'll be stable, available, and you will be in the Lord abiding until the final day in Jesus' name. In verse 17, then we which are alive, alive in Christ, alive in righteousness, alive in holiness, alive and sensitive to the sound of the trumpet, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another. Those are believers. Not, you don't comfort backsliders with the rapture. You terrify backsliders with the rapture. You don't, uh, you don't comfort secret sinners. Those who are committing sin in secret, you don't comfort them with the rapture. You terrify them. They themselves are afraid. They are frightened by the rapture. But the people who remain in Christ, who abide in Christ, comfort one another with these words. I pray the comfort of the Lord will be in your life in Jesus' name. I come to chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 22. You're waiting for the coming of the Lord. And you want to be there when he comes so that you'll not be disappointed on that day. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's the commandment. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Something appears to be evil. There are people who are thoughtless. They don't think before they do, they don't think of the repercussion, the consequence, the evaluation of the Lord on what they do before they do them. They, they just jump into action. They say whatever they want to say. They never think. They don't think before they speak. They don't think before they act. They don't think before they go somewhere. They don't think before they get involved in something. They don't think before they sign any document. They don't think at all. But it says, you abstain from every appearance of evil. You look at things around you. Don't be so quick. And don't be so impatient. Impatient to talk. Impatient to act. Impatient to do whatever you're doing. Ask yourself, because Jesus may come today. Glad day, glad day. For the believer, Jesus may come today for the unbeliever. Sad day, sad day. They'll just see that the believers have gone. And because he may come today, he may come at any time. That's why you're thoughtful. Before you do whatever you're doing. That's why before you steal that thing, think. Because if you steal that thing, you're still going to make restitution. Think of what will happen. Before you commit that adultery, think. Because if you're going to make your way right, you must do restitution. Think. Before you go into that fornication, think. Because you're still going to make restitution. And if it's going to be impossible for you to make restitution, are you going to see the Lord? On the final day, everything that appears to be evil, you know, this will land me in trouble. This will land me in guilty conscience. This will land me in hell. Think before you act. Don't do it and then be saying, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why did I go there? Why did I write that? Why did I call like that on the phone? Why did I, why did I, why did I abstain from all appearance of evil? And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. I pray he'll sanctify us. Spirit, soul, and body, he'll do it in Jesus' name. I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're willing to be saved, he'll save you. If you're willing to be forgiven, to be cleansed, he'll forgive you and cleanse you. If you're willing to be holy, he'll make you holy. You're willing 
to live an upright life, a righteous life. He'll give you the grace. He'll give you backbone to live an uncompromising life. You will not love yourself above the holiness that will take you to heaven. What I mean by that is you are facing a life that is painful for your body, painful for your flesh. You see, flesh, after all, if I die before he comes, he'll be buried in the ground. You will not hinder me. This heaven, I will get there. Your flesh will not hinder you. Yeah. Friends, you know there are friends. There are some people that love their friends more than Christ. And their friends are saying, do it for me. If you don't do it for yourself, do it on my behalf. Do it because of me. Don't you love me? We love you, but we love heaven. Would you give up heaven for a friend? And for both of you to go to hell? No. It may be painful for the flesh or for whatever it is, but holiness must be number one. And if it's number one, that's the priority of your life. That's how to prepare. You'll make it in Jesus' name. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. We're coming to point number two, perplexing peril at his return. Perplexing peril at his return. As the first Thessalonians speaks about the rapture, the second Thessalonians speaks about the return, the second coming of Christ. As we have traced the rapture, in the first Thessalonians, we trace the second coming, the return. In second Thessalonians, I'm looking at chapter, two, chapter 1, second Thessalonians verse, verse, uh, verse 7. It says, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. To you who are persecuted, rest with us. To those of you who are facing trials of life, rest with us. For those of you who have difficulties in your place of work, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes again after the rapture has taken place. At taking place, there will be peril and danger, pain and suffering, punishment for those who have not believed, for those who obey not the gospel. Have you thought about the details of the rapture? On the day of the rapture, there's going to be perplexing peril. A car is being driven and, you know, people fill up the car. Passengers are there. And the driver happens to be a believer. And the trumpet sounds. The dead in Christ rise up. And the driver being a believer. And he's uh, one of those people that shall be caught away. The Lord catches him away. What happens to that car? There will be an accident. And those people can have bruises and broken bones. As they get them to the hospital, the hospital is in a pandemonium. Why? The doctors were, so, were operating somebody, and the rapture takes place. And those who are believers among those doctors, they are caught away. That fellow is still on the operating table. And they bring all these other people from the accidents on the roads because cars colliding, because of the rapture, who is going to treat them? There will be perplexing peril at the return of Christ, even at the rapture. Look at that aeroplane there, and you have hundreds of people who are in the aeroplane. It just so happens that one of the pilots there, or the two pilots, they are believers. And as they are believers, the rapture takes place, and they are taken away. What happens to that plane? Think about that. As we think about the rapture, a lot of calamities are going to happen on that day of the rapture. You are just going on the side of the road yourself. You are not in a car. And a car is coming, or somebody is 
riding motorcycle and the person is riding the motorcycle happens to be a believer is caught away and the motorcycle comes away and knocks you down there's nobody to pick you up the other fellow they are they are carrying is also lying on the ground with all the bruises on the, of the accident because of the rapture that has taken place now you're on the sea and you have hundreds of people in the ship and you have, uh, you know, the people, the sailors there, those who are Christians and those who are still abiding in Christ. And there you are on the stormy sea. And then the sailors are taken away in the rapture. What happens to all those people? They are the perplexing peril at the time of the rapture and at the time of his return. Now, the time of his return, he now comes deliberately to judge. There's a great day coming. A great day coming when the sinners shall be separated from the saints. And then the Lord is asking, where will you be on that day? There's a sad day coming, a sad day coming when the sinner will hear the doom and never knew you. Depart from ye that walk in equity. Where will you stand at that time? There's going to be peril for those who have not obeyed the gospel. It's one thing to hear the gospel. There are many people who have heard the gospel. Have you obeyed the gospel? Repent ye and believe the gospel. Have you repented? Turn away from sin and turn to God. Have you turned to God? Receive Jesus Christ as your personal savior. Have you done that? That's part of that's the gospel. They have not obeyed the gospel. What calamity, what danger, what evil, and what suffering will come upon those unrepentant people on that final day? First Peter chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 17. Perplexing peril at his return. We're looking at this in uh, first in uh, first Peter chapter four verse seventeen. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Judgment must begin at the house of God. What does that mean? Begin at the church. Judgment must begin at the church. Have you noticed that any time we're going to have the Lord's supper? And you have all the halls filled up with adults and youth and children, with fathers and mothers, with workers and members, with preachers and congregation. And I will say we're going to have the Lord's Supper. And make sure that you don't take the emblems of the body and the blood of Christ wrongfully. Because if you do, there's judgment. You find thousands of people running away. They are not qualified. They themselves know. Their consciences tell them that they cannot take the Lord's Supper. Now tell me, if they are not qualified for the Lord's Supper now, if the rapture should take place, at that time, the Lord saw... You have received the message from our pastor, Pastor W.F. Kumoye, the general superintendent of the Palais Bible Church. It is my wish that as you listen, you will accept the old world and you will let them sink into the, your hearts. And by the grace of the Lord, you will never regret it. It is my prayer that by next week, when our, our pastor shall come up again to present another message, you will be there your family will be there, and your friends. And I believe as you are listening to the message every week, by the grace of the Lord, you will never be the same. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, O Lord, because of today's message. We thank you, O Lord, because of the one you let us listen to last week, and the one we are going to listen to the next week, by the power in the blood of Jesus Christ. If you tarry, we shall listen together once again next week. And if not, every one of us, will be there with you in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because you are the Lord that answers prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.